Everything is online and everyone's relying on it more than ever now. And that's not just people with disabilities, but everyone. What I realized is that I was putting myself, particularly in this COVID-19 crisis, at a greater risk. Well, good morning and good afternoon. A warm welcome to the my wonderful guests and anyone watching and listening uh, to the new ProCure discussion series. My name is Andy Bolan. I'm the Associate Director for Patient and Medical Community in Engagement at ProQR and the lucky host of uh, today's discussion. Through these short conversations, we're aiming to break down some of the tougher topics, which are always a challenge to communicate. Firstly, though, let me come to our guests, Molly Watt in the UK and Rebecca Alexander on the East Coast of the US in New York. Molly, how are you? And is the weather as lovely as it is here in the Netherlands? I'm good, thank you. As good as I can be, all, all things considered. And yes, the weather is delightful. <laughs> <laughs> and Rebecca, how are you? And uh, what is the view from your window? I mean, you just said that in the previously that you went for a walk. Uh, is the weather as lovely in New York? The, the weather is absolutely beautiful. Yesterday, I didn't even leave my apartment. <laughs> um, but the brick wall from my window is absolutely beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Right. Well, let's get to it. Today, we'll be looking at uh, accessible information in an isolated time, looking at the new emerging world around us. Uh, you two were the first in, uh, that came to mind to really open up this discussion. So welcome. Uh, Molly Watt is a tech and web accessibility and usability consultant, motivational speaker, children's author, illustrator, blogger, international ambassador, and advocate for those living with challenges. She writes that her passion lies in assistive technology, tech for good, website and environmental accessibility, inclusion, and usability. Rebecca Alexander is an author, psychotherapist, group fitness uh, instructor, advocate, and extreme athlete who was born with Usher syndrome type three and has simultaneously lost both uh, losing both her sight and hearing since she was a teenager. Her critically acclaimed memoir, Not Fade Away, A Memory of Senses Lost and Found, received an Indie Book Award and was honored as one of the MS Society's books for a better life. Welcome both of you. I'm very honored to uh, have you both with us. So we'll jump straight into the uh, what we're going to be looking at, and, and I think we'll start with accessibility. So coming to you, Molly, what is uh, accessible information from your perspective? Um, so for me, um, so I'm registered deafblind myself, and I have had everything digitised since I was about 12, and having that meant that I could adjust it to be accessible for me. Um, so make it larger, I could have it read out to me. Um, and so the importance of having all content accessible means being compatible with all assistive technologies, which then isn't just beneficial to me, but actually beneficial to everybody who uses um, and relies on assistive technology. Um, I think I've always, been, I've always been very passionate about having all things accessible. Um, and only because I have experienced being excluded, like applying for university, that was all online. I could not access that. I had to ask someone to do that for me. And that was ultimately meant to be something that was an independent task, but it turned into me having to ask for assistance, which as an individual, that was quite uh, emotionally kind of stunting. Um, it, it wasn't great. So I think since, since kind of blogging and, and working in the field, I've just grown more progressively passionate about it because there's so many things in life that everyone has equal right to have access to and I think it's only more um more important it's just it's always been important but it, it it's highlighted so much more in in difficult times like these the amount of um, videos that have been posted without any captions any audio description um documents and articles that are spoken in language that no one can understand unless you've got you know a degree and in, in whatever um and it, it makes you feel as an individual that you you don't have that right that you're not clever enough or that you that you're not a part of society um everything is online um you know everything it, from reading the news to youtube to watching films everything is online and everyone's relying on it more than ever now and that's not just people with disabilities but everyone um and so when we think about who could be using our devices now and what what 
what needs they have, um, it's pretty essential to be thinking, how accessible is this? And can everybody actually retain and, and understand what is being told of everybody? Um, especially when there's so many important things that people have to be paying attention to. Um, I, I read that a lot of um, people I knew in the deaf community didn't even know what um, a pan, how do you say, a pandemic, 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 <laughs> pandemic yeah. was. They had no idea what it was. And it was like, okay okay that's a term that we don't use every day to be fair so actually as a deaf person being brought up deaf it's not it's not unusual for that person not to have heard that kind of terminology um and that was you know that was just at the start the very beginning i I got to thinking crikey you know we're in we're in for the long haul here and we're all jumping online right away trying to find out you know what old Boris is doing or Trump or whatever you know mm. and, and we've all got opinions around it and it, I think it's just it, it's basic human right and and safe safety and health we we're talking about here so I just think it's only been like the importance of accessibility has just been elevated so much higher than ever before even though it was already there to, for me but it was just even higher um even higher and it's just just crazy that it hasn't already been thought about to be honest with you but it's definitely um yeah i think people are realizing now that it's 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 really pretty important. important yeah yeah really important and that understanding and rebecca i'll come to you for the kind of to follow up that is why why is it for you that understanding and, and important for people and organizations news broadcasters in the current uh, world to make that information accessible what kind of What's your thought on that? Well, you know, I mean, it, I think that we just don't even realize um, as even able-bodied people are fully sighted and fully hearing just how um, how fortunate we are to have access to information so easily without having a second thought. And, you know, one of the things that, it, particularly in New York City that we see now is people are wearing masks, right? And so if you are someone who has hearing loss, um, and you rely on lip reading, how are you able to hear someone or gather information? Now, on the other hand, um, you know, I mean, it, it just, I think the accessibility piece online that Molly mentioned is so vast. Um, you know, one of the things that we need to figure out now, everybody's using Zoom and they're using, you know, Google Hangout or Google Classroom um, or Blackboard, you know, the, um, there's so many different um, platforms that people are using to, to gather and to meet and being able to create the captioning. And so for someone with both vision and hearing loss, some of these um, platforms like Zoom has uh, the captioning capability, but also making it so that you can actually read it because it's very small. The font itself is very small. Um, but, you know, one of the things too is, you know, going out and getting groceries right now that a lot of people are encouraged not to leave their apartments at all. Um, in, in New York City, we live in apartments. Um, but what, what's interesting is that usually, you know, when I go, there's a grocery store that I go to and there happens to be a large blind population right in that neighborhood. And so usually when I walk there and I see someone using a cane or a dog, I say, you know, hi, sir, let me get someone from the store who can help you. And that person will grab their arm and take them around. But now we're in the place of social distancing, at least in the U.S. and I assume around the world, yeah. we're told to stay, um, you know, six feet from, from everyone. And so when you rely so much on your tactile, um, you know, sort of functioning, it makes it, it very difficult. Um, so there, there are so many different ways in which I think we're affected, but most importantly, you know, I do a lot of mental health first responder work and there was a deaf person who went who was having some symptoms and he went to the hospital and he doesn't sign. So I thought I was going to be, you know, using sign language with him with the doctor, but it turns out he needed to read lips and the doctor had a mask on. So here I am trying to help like I mean, I have cochlear implants, but like I'm human and trying to hear as well as I can. So it was um, it was sort of a mess and we were able to make it work. But uh, it's just interesting to think of the ways in which, you know, people are so um, uh, we're already isolated when you have vision and hearing loss and what a greater sort of disadvantage this puts you in. And so this is, a, I think, a big time to start thinking outside of ourselves that we're all very sort of scared of what our circumstances are. But think about somebody who might have even greater needs or um, lesser access accessibility than you do and how you might be able to help. And so do you think um, this is a question to open to both of you, but maybe Molly, I'll come to you. 
the kind of importance of that equal access to information and kind of do what Rebecca was saying, you know, being able to give it over as clearly as possible to everyone. Um, how has the kind of COVID-19 information been presented? Have you seen any good um, kind of examples or, or kind of bad examples? The one that comes to mind for me is, you know, the UK government is doing and, and the US government is doing a lot of press conferences at the moment where they're standing up and, and actually I watched one with the chief scientific officer where he pointed at a graph and he was like here on the graph he didn't ex didn't explain it at all well and to me you know we've had a very recent experience in Paris where I met both of you and we had we've got a lot of learnings about how to present better as a, as a company but that really stuck with me I mean how do you think it's been presented? I have to admit, um, so here in the UK, um, there was quite, a, yeah, so like you say, the daily press conferences with uh, old Boris Johnson on the screen, I'd never, I've never watched so much TV, to be honest with you, because in our house, um, in our living room, the TV is so far away because um, of the way our house is set up, our living room. And then downstairs, we have a smaller TV in the kitchen. And that'd be where I'd be standing close to watching the TV, whereas opposed, I would normally be using my, my laptop just reading articles because that was just more accessible. Um, but what I found with the press conferences and when they had, um, they sort of had this panel of, of people speaking, um, um, and what they what what they did, and they have they, I haven't done it. They haven't done it the last couple of days. But every time one of them speaking, they pull up their like little biography, um, the kind of like you know who they are, what they do, da, da, da. and that would change every time someone was talking. So it was almost like giving me extra context as to who was talking and why he was talking, what his background was. And when that changed, that told me that the speaker changed as well. So that's, that's, that's a sort of, um, with some subtitles, that's what they do. They change the color. That's when you know the speakers changed and, you know, things like that. So what I liked was that they were actually taking that kind of design into, um, into consideration. And they probably did that for lots of other reasons, but from an accessibility point of view, I was like, this is cool. Cause this is actually Actually giving me more 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 context for you know what's being talked about um i did have to sit quite close to the screen to read it um it wasn't massively it wasn't tiny the contrast was good and the text was good um i have noticed they've, they've had um bsl interpreters as well i don't personally rely on bsl but I, like like you say andy you look out for these things once you've um you know you start thinking about these things um and i i I would mainly say that um, the, the the TV, the televised side of things, has actually been quite good. It's mainly the the, the media content that, that is online that most of us actually turn to. You know, it's all the stuff that gets shared around Facebook and, you know, articles from BBC or, you know, CNN, wherever. Um, th those are more problematic, I would say, when it comes to kind of the language and accessibility. Um, and, of course, as Rebecca touched on, that kind of, level of isolation um, when you just want to reach out and ask someone for help and so the next port of call would be jumping online to find out this information and then if that information is not accessible you feel more isolated than you started with um, and I personally don't feel I can leave my house obviously on my own um, I have my guide dog um, so I'll leave to go for a walk for my daily exercise but that's not that's that's not funny out information that's just for my own sanity leaving the house on a daily basis um so it has it has been an interesting one it certainly has as rebecca said it's heightened um the the amount of inaccessible experiences um because although we were, we were already struggling with not being able to lip read and you know things like that and now the masks i mean that's yeah. just <laughs> that's yeah <laughs> I, have seen, I have seen some some places doing not not during this pan pandemic but like the um the marks that are see-through so you can actually see the lips i'd like to see more of those um that would be taken more into consideration of those not only just uh people who are deaf but also just people that are visual i think it's a good communication tool to be looking at people looking at people's faces when you're talking mm -hmm. and as soon as someone has a mask on and i i i experienced it when we came over to paris at the airport they were already starting to wear masks they didn't look very approachable <laughs> they did, i didn't really feel like i could go over there and ask them for help and this was members 
members of staff and that's purely because I'm a visual person and that's not just people who are deaf a lot of people are visual um, and I yeah. feel like if you look that way <laughs> you're not you're not going to ask that person for help <laughs> no absolutely not <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> stay <away. laughs> yeah I'm just gonna pick, just gonna pick up BSL British Sign Language just for, yes yes sorry um, British Sign Language yeah and it's and it's, it's interesting here in the Netherlands um the lady who does the sign language for the, the government announcements has actually kind of gone a bit viral because obviously we've had a lot of hoarding, a lot of people panic buying, which is not helpful yeah. in the wider context. Yeah. Um, but her, the, the word in Dutch hamstering, um, she describes as kind of this, which has just gone viral. And, and I was just kind of, yeah. for me, it's, it's uh, you know, and I was going to ask uh, you, Rebecca, what is the sign language, the kind of American sign language or international sign language uh, word for kind of hoarding? Or I was just wondering if it's a set, similar because it's, it's become very, it, it got some very good press here. And actually what I loved was that kind of, it then brings up more accessibility discussions and people going, actually, yeah, it's really important for parts of society to have, to be able to be communicated that it's not appropriate to, to hoard. So I guess to come to you from a U.S. perspective, has the information from COVID-19 been done appropriately? Um, and yeah, what are your thoughts on? Well, I think, I think um, what Molly said was pretty accurate here as well. Um, you know, I think I love the idea of having um, the colors of the captioning change, um, you know, so that you know that it's a different speaker for people who don't hear well or who are deaf. Um, and, you know, even thinking of that, I think one of the great features now that they have the ability to change the sort of the background uh, screen. What do you call that, Molly? You know, like the part where the, the text is but is against. I don't know what. Oh, um, yeah, kind of the format background of the text. Yeah, the format yeah. background, you can make it sort of just dis decide how opaque it is, whether it's very black or whether it's a little bit see-through right. or not. And then you can decide what color font you'd like. And for people generally who have um, retinitis pigmentosa, which is the vision part of what both Molly and I have, generally um, we do better with like a yellow font um, or even sometimes a light blue font as opposed to a white um, you know, font. So that kind of thing I think is really great. And, and that some of these smart TVs and uh, have the ability for you to change those colors um, and, and that can be helpful. But I think what Molly said is right on. I mean, I think in general we have, you know, the, um, we, the one thing that I will say that is um, baffling to me is that anytime there's a press conference and my own brother works, you know, as a White House correspondent. Oh, I saw, uh, I saw what went <laughs> <laughs> uh, So the one thing, you know, they don't have an interpreter on that actual stage at the White House of the United States where they have these major press conferences, you have the captioning but there's no ASL interpreter. I, I'm like mind boggled. It blows my mind. Um, now on sort of the state level where we have Andrew Cuomo here, who's doing a, a wonderful job. He's our governor. Um, you know, there always is an interpreter and we haven't had anything go viral with an interpreter of, um, you know, sort of giving some sort of funny sign for hoarding, but certainly, um, you know, there's been information gathered about, you know, stores that are normally open 24 hours now are closing, um, you know, earlier so that they can restock. Uh, but I do think that our biggest challenge, as Molly said, is is digital information. And that is where we get the majority of our information. And there's a lot that's being done in terms of trying to improve accessibility. But oftentimes in trying to improve it, it sometimes actually makes it worse. And that's one thing that Molly and I spoke about in Paris. For instance, now on the Apple phones, they have the ability to do dark mode or light mode well, the problem is, is that it makes it exclusively sort of one or the other. And I'm hopeful many of us have given feedback to Apple. I'm hoping that will improve. But I find myself constantly switching back and forth from invert colors to not invert to smart. I mean, it's just, it's sort of a cluster, you know what, of just trying to be able to get um, the right Color font, yeah, um, against the right background. So it's 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 definitely jumping through hoops, uh, I think, on a daily basis. And that's just for for you know someone like me who does have usable but very limited vision. That's super. So I think we've covered the kind of accessibility challenges and and the current current situation. I'd like to de dig deeper into the kind of isolation piece of the of the discussion topic today. Um, 
And I guess uh, I'll start with you, Rebecca, kind of the new measures being put in place around the world for people to stay inside, self-isolate. Um, what would you say kind of people can do to battle that deeper issues of isolation uh, that come with having to stay inside and, and that stopping that communication? Right. Well, I think that when we have this, so for people traditionally who are um, deafblind, oftentimes and have limited access to travel independently, we have something in the U.S. And Molly, I'm curious to know if you have it or what it's called in the U.K. Um, called SSPs, um, which is the social support providers or people who are assigned to go with you uh, either to a doctor's appointment or to the grocery store to do sort of day-to-day -day activities. Now, that's something we've really been battling and it, it varies state by state to try to get funding to allow for more of those. Uh, we were hoping to go to a city council meeting in another uh, couple of weeks, which now, of course, has been uh, postponed or put off and to really advocate for the need for it to help people with vision and hearing loss um, travel and do independent sort of living activities uh, more regularly. So now if you have someone who's deafblind who was able to secure an SSP for an event even a week or two in advance, because it's not something you can just decide to, you know, you want to go somewhere and do something and an SSP will be available. You usually have to plan in advance. Oftentimes, these people who experience isolation generally look forward to something that's a week away because they know they'll have the opportunity to have someone go with them where they'll feel safe, where they'll feel sort of like they have the type of um, security and guidance that they need. And now that's no longer on the table. So I encourage people to create schedule and routine it's obviously difficult you know when you're home and you don't necessarily have anything to wake up for or things are a lot more flexible now in terms of what's open and who's working and you know when meetings happen it's easy not to set an alarm it's easy to say well it doesn't matter if i sleep until you know 7 a.m or 11 a.m um, but the longer we allow ourselves to be in that pattern the more likely we are to develop uh, depression because in fact, I think sometimes people think that, oh, I can catch up on sleep, which for many of us, we do need to catch up on sleep. But the more you sleep, oftentimes, the more lethargic and even depressed you may feel. So I always encourage people, listen, if you have this time and you can sleep longer because your schedule is a bit different, given that you're home and don't need to be at work at a particular time, then certainly you can give yourself that extra hour, but make sure that you create a sense of consistency and normalcy. This is a really, really good time. I actually think that we uh, focus on the isolation. We focus on all the negative, but what if we were to focus on the things that we can do? Because I guarantee you, all of us have stuff in our apartment and our houses that require attention that we dread having to deal with. And yet now is sort of the time to do it. And I don't think that you have to say, okay, today I'm going to do the spring cleaning on all of my closets. I say allocate a very specific amount of time. If it's an hour, I'm going to spend 30 minutes or I'm going to spend an hour just cleaning, uh, you know, my desk or going through, you know, particular, you know, files. But when you create a very finite amount of time to do specific things, whether they're enjoyable or not enjoyable, uh, it, you're more likely to complete them because you know that this isn't just an open-ended, this is what I need to do today. That I'm gonna spend this 30 minutes doing this and then I can move on. That's super. So I guess Molly, do you believe that uh, people with visual and hearing impairments, you know, will have specific issues with the restrictions that are being put in place by governments and state uh, kind of uh, governmental bodies? Well, um, as Rebecca explained, so yes, we do have um, a system where you can apply to have a guide and that's what we call it. They're, they're like a guide and they come along and they'll take you along to the doctors or whatever a day out. Um, I haven't personally gone down that route. Um, I still live at home uh, with my parents and my, si my one sibling <laughs> who still lives at home. Um, and I have a guide dog. Now, the main thing for me, I think, um, so I, I, I really struggle with my mental health. I've, I've had depression and anxiety since I was 15. And not having routine definitely doesn't make that <laughs> like I've definitely got to have routine otherwise I, I would spend a lot more time in bed um so what 
Rebecca was saying was really, really crucial. My main thing uh, about leaving the house and following sort of guidelines and things that government, the government have sort of laid out is that I'm not likely to leave the house on my own. I would want to leave with somebody um, and have somebody help me out doing stuff, which it's quite tricky when you've got this whole social distancing, so, social distancing rule over your head and it's, it's literally been spouted out all the time. Everywhere you go, everywhere online is talking about social distancing, it's talking about COVID, it's talking about, it's, it's everywhere. So I kind of feel like a naughty child if I was to leave my house now and hold on to my mum who's actually guiding me and helping me get from A to B. So I kind of feel like I'm restricted from that option of actually having someone help me um and i feel like a lot of others would be feeling that way um so i i said to my granddad for instance he's 80 81 um and he's vulnerable he's in his house and i said to him you know have you been getting out at all and he said well you know not really and i said well my cousins live down the road you should be asking them to take take you or they can go and pick up some stuff he'll be like no 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 i'd, I'd rather do it on my own and it was that element of pride um which of course he, he is older and he shouldn't be going anywhere but i feel like a lot of people would have that pride of saying well no i want to do it on my own but then that would be putting yourself at risk um, just because you have a disability and you need an aid, like someone guiding you. Um, and you would go on your own based on the rules of being, you have to keep distant from everyone. And actually that's not, that's not, that's not great. And of course in supermarkets and things, so they've started um, putting these rules in some supermarkets. Um, they only allow a select amount of people into the shop at a time. Others, um, you know, they have these hours for um, old people. I don't, they don't call it for old people. They call it for <laughs> uh, the elderly. Um, and, and I've wondered if there was like a, 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 a section for people with disabilities because it's like actually – I'm not, I'm not vulnerable health wise, you know, if I, I'm, I'm okay health wise, it's more that my, my inability to get around independently and go around a supermarket when there's all this panic buying and stuff, that doesn't appeal to me at all. Um, so I'm fortunate in that I still live at home and my parents will basically go and do that for me. But if I was living at home, I would be really uh, living independently. I'd be really, really struggling to be honest with you, because I wouldn't like the idea of leaving the house on my own with all these restrictions put in place which of course is more about the health of everybody else including yourself so I wouldn't want to be putting any risk on that I'd be like no 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 I'll just stay at home I'll stay at home which of course from a mental health point of view isn't great and um, because obviously you're allowed to leave the house one day one once a day um for a walk one form of exercise or whatever that means um but I, so what I've been doing personally is that I've been telling myself right I have to be out of bed by seven um i have to i have to have eaten by this time i have to be at my desk doing this my lunch is at this time i'll go for my afternoon walk i drag out my afternoon walk till as late as possible because if i go sooner i come back and i'm i'm quite upset about the fact that i can't leave again and that feeling of isolation is quite overwhelming then so i try and keep myself super busy so i'm not thinking about that you know i step outside into the garden because it's nice um so I don't, you know, feel sad for not leaving the house because normally I'd be down to my office, which is 10 minute walk into town. But it's, it is that routine and structure is so important. Um, but it is quite hard when there's all these in, these restrictions that are put in place. And I know why they are. Um, but from an independent point of view, someone who's deaf blind and relies on, you know, people helping and guide dog helping and things like that, it's... Yeah, <laughs> it's challenging, challenging. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess just a, a different tact. I mean, you, you mentioned your grandfather there. I mean, Rebecca, how are you staying in touch with friends and family? Are you, are you kind of Zooming? You've mentioned Zoom and kind of Skyping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I do all of my therapy sessions via Zoom, um, but I FaceTime, you know, and I know that uh, Androids have Duo and there's WhatsApp. Um, so there are all these different video functions that I think are so important. I mean, you know, it's funny because you call a family member and it's, you know, not doing anything much different than I was doing yesterday. Not much has changed in my bedroom, in my living room than from what was happening yesterday. Um, and I oftentimes end up putting my video on my dog because that's the most entertaining sort of <laughs> aspect of my life right now. But, you know, one of the things 
that I think is important is that this is actually a really good time for people with vision and hearing loss to try accessing there because there are as much as there's not accessibility there are things that are accessible and again if we try to focus on what we can do instead of what we can't I always think that we're more likely to make better progress and feel a greater sense of uh, ability and independence when we work with what we do have and continue to work on improving the things that have not yet been created or that need to um, improve but there's two things that I think of one of which is this is a good time for people with vision loss in particular and hearing loss to sort of maybe introduce themselves to some of these apps, um, you know, to some of the functions that are out there that they've been hesitant to sort of look at or try to work through because they're afraid that they won't be able to figure it out. There's, this is a really good time to work on kind of familiarizing yourself with that stuff. For some people, I think it really has more to do with not wanting to have to admit to themselves that this is something that they need. It doesn't always feel good to say that, you know, there's this is uh, an accessibility function I need to start using or maybe I should look into because even for some people who are able to read smaller font, um, there are larger options that actually would make your life much easier and also um, keep you from tiring as easily and quickly as, as you do when you use smaller, um, you know, font functioning. The other thing is, is that the other night, you know, I took my dog out to go for a walk and usually she goes right away and we come back in. But for whatever reason this night, she decided we were going around the block and that was my fault for not bringing my cane. I didn't anticipate it. And what I realized is that I was putting myself, particularly in this COVID-19 crisis, at a greater risk because here I have my dog and I'm supposed to maintain six feet of distance from, you know, for social distancing. And I very well could have walked into anybody walking down the street uh, because I was, I didn't have my cane with me and I simply didn't see them. And so this, I think, is another time for people who, particularly in our community, I think one of the greatest things that we see is this unwillingness or this fear or the not wanting to have to use your cane. I think this is actually a good time to maybe practice using that and if for no other reason, consider it to um, alert other people to stay away from you because you yourself will not know uh, if someone is sort of in, you know, coming towards you in your field of vision um, and you uh, outside of your field of vision, but close to you and you simply don't know. So just food for thought. Super. I, so I guess um, I come on to a, another question in a world where everyone is becoming isolated. Uh, what are the things that I guess on a positive note, we can learn from the kind of uh, visual and hearing uh, kind of impaired community, which, you know, are having to deal with isolation as part of their lives. Is there anything that we can learn? Is there anything, any positives that we can kind of bring together? Molly, I guess I'll come to you. Yeah, I mean, it's not massive, to be honest with you, but I think I've been more and more conscious about um, reaching out to people. Um, mm -hmm. So I have been FaceTiming my granddad daily and my brother and a few of my friends. I don't have very many friends, but I make a point of each time I'm sitting down having a cup of tea, FaceTime someone, just check in on them. And I'd be like, I know you heard from me, from me earlier. I just wanted to check in, make sure you're still OK and have a little chat. Literally, it'd be like five minutes. And I've been doing that quite a lot because it's quite good for me as it is for them so I, I have a friend who her world has basically been put upside down like like all of us to be honest this routine is just totally different and um and I know what it's like to to just want to sleep all the time and I'm like I know it's so easily done so I'm constantly calling this friend of mine I'm like right are you out of bed yet? Are you out of bed, right? If you're not, get out of bed. And I'm constantly calling them. And it's, it's annoying them, but I feel like I'm doing good by doing that, keeping in touch with everybody um, so that we don't all feel like we are totally alone. Um, and I have another friend who also just sits at a desk like I do. And we will literally just have the phone on, looking at each other, doing our work. <laughs> and we might put some music on. And we're just keeping up that kind of momentum and encouraging each other to keep going. Um, and then I'd say, right, I'm, I'm going to go for a 30-minute walk now. And they'd say, yeah. I'm going to do the same i'll text you when i'm done sort of thing so it's like checking in with people that you don't see all the time and i think that's something that's priceless um particularly for my granddad who is on his own and um, he has his ipad he loves his ipad um and for us as well um 
I recently, I was telling Andy just before we started uh, recording, I've recently become an auntie. Um, I'm a very proud auntie, but of course, I'm so gutted I can't meet my little my little nephew. Um, but thankfully, been receiving all these pictures and videos, um, which I can zoom in and change colours to ensure that I can actually see him. Um, and when I was on FaceTime to my granddad, my granddad said, oh, I haven't seen any, but I don't know what, what Casper looks like. You know, I said, right, OK, I'll talk you through. I'm going to send you some emails, granddad, with some pictures. He's email so I was literally on the phone for about an hour like right okay so you know the the box with the envelope he said no Molly I can just see your face so I said no that okay home screen tap the home. literally started from scratch I talked through all the little apps and I was like right now tap into you know the email icon you should have received the uh, and then I was watching his facial expression as he was looking at these pictures and he was zooming in and that's his great great grandson um so for him that that was his great grandson. That that was like such a magical moment that for him, four hours away, he was able to see his his um, great grandson for the first time. Um, and I think I think that was just that was so nice because it was like okay, I didn't have to come. We didn't have to come up physically to see you to do that. We could still experience that kind of closeness by 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 FaceTime and the magical wonders of tech. Um, so that was really nice. So yeah. So as I said, it's it's quite. It, yeah, it's not massive, but it, it is massive. Just just reaching out and, and keeping in touch with people, um, assuring that they haven't been forgotten and whatever they may be doing in their day to day, just keeping in with their routine and just encouraging them to keep going because I appreciate things like that. So I only imagine that others would as well. Um, and as Rebecca said, all these apps that are available is so essential just to keep in touch with, with things that can actually really help enhance your day to day, whether you are in the house all day um, or whether it's something that you can experiment with for the day when we can all leave the house. <laughs> um, I think I think these are all things that we should really keep an open mind about because it's like, OK, we now know exactly how impactful tech can be. We've all been isolated. Um, I and Rebecca and other people have already experienced experience isolation due to a disability but everyone else suddenly and I wrote a blog about it suddenly everyone else is feeling isolated um, for no other reason besides COVID and actually this is where this now is the time to reach out and use those tools so that we don't feel as isolated so that we can still keep in touch with reality society and that's why accessibility being in the center of that assuring that everybody is still connected um, is, is so essential so essential and that's a fantastic point and, and rebecca i guess building on that do you think that there could be and hopefully will be a societal a wider societal understanding about isolation you know we're all being isolated right now but actually of people who who have that challenge on a day-to-day -day basis or is that yeah. too old or is that too uh, like idealist and altruist is yeah i think, think? It's like, i mean listen i i i wish and i really can, I'm very hopeful that people will be more mindful of that, but I think that by in general, people are very sort of self-focused. And so I, I personally think that the more self-focused we are in improving or thinking about what's not working for us, the more, uh, the more self-focused we become. Whereas when we consider the needs of other people and we look outside of ourselves, we actually are able to feel uh, like we're a part of something much bigger and we're also reminded of how much we do have and we are capable of and so how we reinforce that um, is difficult to sort of say but one of the things I wanted to touch upon just um, to follow up with what Molly said is there's two things that I can think of during this time particularly of isolation that I think could be important um, one of which is if you have any friends or people that you know in your life who are healthcare providers even just shooting them a message and saying listen I'm thinking of you um, you know, if you need to reach out to talk about anything other than COVID, I'm here, uh, or something like that, because this is a particularly difficult time. These are the people on the front lines that we don't hear about or hear from as much. They're exhausted, they're stressed, they're overworked. Um, and so this is a time, I think, where they really deserve and need to be recognized and to know that we're thinking of them. But the other thing is, is that so many things now are being done on, uh, on Zoom. Uh, for instance, we're trying to actually encourage uh, a big company like Peloton that when they do um, coaching, you know, a lot of people want to be physically active and they're physically active at home. Um, 
your your cueing. I think that's one thing. And and whether you're on the you know on a Zoom call and there's anybody who's visually impaired or whether you're teaching a fitness class, um, the best I think one of the biggest uh, downfalls we have or difficulties we face is not having appropriate cueing. So as opposed to saying, watch my left leg or you should be going at this speed and giving a number, which a person who has a visual impairment or is blind doesn't know or can't see, using more sort of descriptive, like bring your left leg, you know, outside of your right hand, um, or, you know, just using, thinking about the way that we communicate. Um, if you were to close your eyes and you couldn't tell, you know, you had to imagine someone telling you how to do something what would you need them to say so that you could accurately sort of follow their instruction? Mm -hmm. um, so those are small things, but absolutely. I, I think that this is an important time for us to really think about not only ourselves, but, but others. Super. Well, I think as we come to a close, uh, I want to thank you both for the wonderful discussion. And I wanted to take the last uh, few minutes uh, to come to you both individually and ask, some concluding remarks about the great discussion we've had and also the challenges or, or positives that are going to come, I guess, in, in the near or medium future, because it looks like this kind of uh, situation is going to be with us for certainly three to six months. So, Molly, can I come to you first? Any concluding remarks? Yeah, I suppose. Um, so taking it from a slightly different angle, so since I've been working from home and um, there's a, a company that I work part-time for, part-time for, part talk, um, and we've been really relying on Microsoft Teams to really keep connected and video calls and things like that. Um, and I think more and more now people are considering how accessible the video conferences the conferencing side of things um can be um so with captions and you can blur out your background and change colors things like that that is something that makes my life easier so not only am i seeing your faith the the accessibility of this whole video call is 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 really really good um and i think from a a work ethic point of view like people are considering these things like without question now so it's like okay gonna have a call now let's put on the captions and the uh, would you like any transcriptions after this blah 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 um transcriptions are great because obviously they're kind of you know you're meeting notes so anybody can can benefit from the transcription of a meeting so someone that couldn't make it online um although that was initially for accessibility that's something that anybody could could benefit from you know they may not have made that meeting um so it's kind of um different ways of actually um communicating through work as well um so as, as rebecca was saying with all these zoom calls and things like that for um fitness and it, it is proving to be um a positive way forward because i think a lot of people were kind of worried because it's like oh gosh like everything's just going to be digital and inhuman and things like that but actually no i think having these video calls so long as they are accessible um keeps it more human um because we are still interacting with people we're not robots you know we are actually um face to face communicating um and having these extra tools and, and features can help enable that person do a job be a part of a conversation be a part of a meeting and and be productive um which is really important um on a day-to-day -day, particularly if you're you know isolated and you want to you want to work and, and just keep busy. Um, so I think, I think positively, um, the companies that I've been working with, I think they're actually thinking more and more about this now because it's not only something that benefits me, but it benefits everybody, um, which as, as you know, however you take that, I think is positive because actually people like me will benefit from that um, in the long run. Um, so hopefully when it comes to the point where we all meet face to face again, these things won't be forgotten, um, that these things will still be taken into account um, when we go to conferences, things like captioning and, and interpreters and things like that. Something like, okay, so these are the things that we needed before when we were online. Um, these are things that we should still consider. Not, not now, okay, we're not online anymore we don't have to check um we'll just deal with it um so i think hopefully it'll kind of change behaviors a bit um get people thinking more around um how 
digital is actually a positive impact rather than it just being an extra or a bonus or something. And I think everyone can really appreciate that because a lot of people are relying on it for 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 income, for work, um, for motivation, um, and it, it's genuinely a big part of everybody's life right now. Like, <laughs> um, so hopefully, I think in that sense, people will start to see more of an importance around having inclusivity um you know whether it be the workplace or, or whatever um online super and rebecca any concluding remarks yeah I, I think that um in general just working on the accessibility uh for all digital uh aspects i think is huge particularly right now i think people actually have more time maybe now to be able to really focus on that and i think that all companies that create greater accessibility and inclusion um you actually do a lot for your company um, sort of from a social perspective i think that it's very much um appreciated and um even what's the word i'm looking for uh that people even reward you know, the companies, for instance, Zoom, you know, they didn't go out and just market themselves all over the place and try to sell their product like crazy when COVID came out because this was not the time to do that. Now, uh, I think even by not taking this, uh, you know, huge stance and trying to sell their product, people by nature needed to go to them, but that speaks volumes about sort of the ethics um, and the ethos of the company itself. And so I think that in general, when companies actually take the time and even spend some of their resources in making their product accessible and their website or their digital marketing and materials accessible, that you're actually doing so much more for the greater good. And you're also improving, I think, the value of your company itself. And people, it will go a lot further than you actually uh, believe or even know. And that is a wonderful ending. I would like to thank both of you for your time. Uh, you at home watching or listening, wherever you might be, and my great ProQR digital colleagues who have make, made this run so smoothly. Uh, I know from my perspective, I've learned a lot and I really have appreciated your time. This was Accessible Information in an Isolated Time featuring the wonderful Rebecca Alexander and Molly Watt. Thank you. <laughs>